All right, now I'd like to welcome to the show Jim Petakoukas, American Enterprise Institute Senior Fellow and author of the very recently published book, The Conservative Futurist. You can see it there over his shoulder, How to Create the Sci-Fi World We Were Promised. Welcome to Free the Economy, Jim. Oh, thank you, thank you so much, Richard. I appreciate it. Uh, you know, I'm pretty excited for this, I got to say, because uh, I feel like your book was engineered in a laboratory to be uh, ex ex exactly the kind of book that me and uh, the Free the Economy crowd is pretty excited about. Um, so we talk a lot about uh, abundance and uh, the uh, freedom to uh, charge run course and make and build and uh, do great stuff in the world. So uh, we are we're already uh, pretty primed to uh, to love what's uh, to love what you've written. So That's to great. to start with, uh, you know, most of us are used to people who are uh, in politics or observers of politics uh, divide the the political world in this country between progressive and conservative or left wing and right wing. But of course, your book has a, a completely different uh, construct uh, that you argue we should use, um, and that is that look at things as either upwing or downwing what does it mean to be upwing well uh you know the the name of the book is conservative futurist and that is a truth in labeling effort uh i am a conservative i work at a right of center think tank but to want to create a better world through economic growth and technological progress and thinking those things are good uh, enhance not just prosperity, but allow us to solve problems big and small. I don't think that is, you, you need to be on one side of that traditional political divide. Uh, I, 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 I make the point that whether you're a Democrat or Republican or however you want to describe yourself, if you think like those things are good, that you know, we, we need a world of more prosperity, that people who are very poor in this world, that someday their position can be remarkably better. To me, that is that is looking up, that is upwing. And I did not, and of course you have the people who are just the opposite. You have the people who think, you know what? The poor can never be as rich as folks in the West. Uh, technological change, too much risk. I mean, if we think this was... A 50-year-old issue with nuclear power, clearly it isn't, because with this, these new advances in, uh, with AI, some people are already focusing purely on the potential for job loss or the robots all killing us. So this is a very real thing, and I call those folks downwingers. Now, I did not invent those phrases, though I have repurposed them for my mm -hmm. own uh, diabolical purposes in this <laughs> in this book. And it's really, to me, the, the you know the uh, greatest expression of this ethos was in the film interstellar where matthew mcconaughey's character cooper who is an astronaut turned farmer because civilization is collapsing said you know like what happened to us we used to look up in the sky and look think about our place in the stars and now we just look at the ground and think about our places in the in the dirt so to me that is a great uh cinematic and rare unfortunately distillation of this ethos yeah so in the book, you talked about, uh, you know, like you, <clears throat> like you just did the sort of like general conceptual idea of what, uh, what upwing and downwing attitudes are like, but then you also describe some periods, specific periods in American history that are more upwing or downwing than others. And so you've got uh, a couple, two periods that you think of as primarily uh, when, when a lot of upwing stuff was happening in our country, when people generally had upwing attitudes, one is longer after World War II and one is shorter back in the 90s. Can you tell us about, uh, about those periods how how you how you know when they started how you know when they ended um and 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 what it means to to say that a certain time in american history was was more upwing than another yeah now you know to some extent there's a, there's a bit of arbitrariness and i kind of get that in the book that you could pick exact dates uh and i you know i don't want to put it down to the exact uh you know month uh you know you know day and and minute but i think broadly uh you know upwing 1.0 uh really began uh, in the night, the mid mid nineteen fifties, uh, ended in the early nineteen seventies, and you had a lot of things were popping. You had just statistically during that period, uh, very fast economic growth. You had very fast productivity growth. How you know workers being more productive? Uh, but you you didn't have to look at the economic statistics. You could look around. I mean, the beginning of the space age. 
uh, the beginning of the atomic age. You had lots of cultural things. You had not yet, uh, which I focus a lot on is the Tomorrowland part of Disneyland. You had what I call upwing media, whether it be, you know, the Jetsons or 2001 Space Odyssey or, or, or Star Trek. So that period, and it, which end if I, I mean, the specific date I picked for it to end uh, is 1973. I could have picked 1972 when we basically ended uh, the manned space program. Uh, but I could have picked 73, which is statistically when we saw a downshift, what I call the great downshift in productivity growth. Uh, and the only sort of upshift since then really to me, is the late 1990s. You saw it statistically again, economic growth, productivity growth booming. But also, and anyone old enough to have lived through that era, yes, you know, you had like, you know, Windows 95, all these companies going public. But there was just a a a a, a feeling in that era, which I think manifested particularly well in, in Wired magazine, that this that something had happened, that we had entered a new period of sustained, accelerated economic growth. That was going to go on forever. One of my favorite, one of my favorite bits is that there was a great report that Lehman Brothers put out in the end of 1999, in which this esteemed, you know, uh, American uh, investment bank said basically, as good as things have been, you know, here in the late 90s, get used to it because it ain't never going to stop. Now, you know, Lehman Brothers didn't even make it another decade, uh, you know, because they 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 collapsed. Um, it's very hard to predict to predict uh, things, especially about the future. But that was a that was a, a definite upwing sort of 2.0 period. And I think, and this is uh, what, what I, I hope the book is right about, that we are beginning an upwing 3.0 period, thanks in part, I think, to all these emerging technologies. And I hope we can back it up with a public policy and a culture that is supportive because, you know, Technological change and progress, it's disruptive. Things change. Uh, companies rise and fall. People, they're either maybe they'll lose jobs or the, the, what they do in their job will be different. And if people don't have an image of the future and hope in the future that it will be better for them or at least their children, then there's going to be a lot of pushback like we've seen with, unfortunately, with trade and against immigration. Yeah, and. You know, one of the things we talk about a lot uh, here on the show and that and we frequently mention is uh, energy and how important it is to any you know, nation or society to have a, a steady supply of affordable energy. And that's one of those kind of like master inputs to the economy among, among a, right. a few others that play a really big role. You know, Julian Simon famously called energy uh, the master resource. So, you know, when we look at uh, going from a, a sort of upwing period of high economic growth to uh, this, you know, sort of downwing period starting in the early 70s, a lot of people, and you mentioned in the book, a lot of people have blamed the economic stagnation that started in the 70s on the Arab oil embargo and that global energy crisis. But you seem to sort of disagree that that was like the the most important uh, trigger for this. How 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 did that uh, the 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 70s shock play into play into this like stagnation? And and if it wasn't if it wasn't really the big, big number one trigger, w you know what could we say to the extent that we can you know pin it on anything? Um, what you know in the in the in the words of the 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 website and Twitter handle WTF happened in 1971. There seemed to be a lot of big macroeconomic stuff that was converging at the yeah. time, and and that uh, air you know air oil embargo and the energy crisis certainly seemed like it was part of it. But but what else are we looking at there? Yeah, you know. The there was like a, you know, sort of a, a, a lot happening, um, both in what we were doing uh, and sort of these macroeconomic conditions. Uh, I, you know, what's interesting is like, what did people think at the time when that, when, when they, you know, cause in 73 and 74, you had a real, and it's kind of a little bit forgotten. So a really nasty recession and, you know, bear market. And, you know, we saw the, you know, fall off of productivity growth and you had these oil shocks. And certainly at the time, that's what people thought. This was the oil shocks, but boy, you know, assuming we could get by these oil shocks, it would be back. Uh, it would be back to all guns uh, blazing here. Um, but it didn't. And by you know, certainly by 1980s, and if you look at like what the uh, you know various you know like the Congressional Budget Office and, and folks were saying, they realized something else had, you know was going on. And certainly at the time, and you know, 
and through today, they said that this economy, American economy, really started to regulate in a way that, uh, you know, maybe you think it's fine. Maybe, you, you know, I, I think there's certainly reasons why we needed, you know, cleaner air. But we regulated in a way that certainly didn't much care about the impact on innovation, economic growth, the ability to build in the real world. And this is kind of pre-cyberspace. So that's all sort of we had. That was not a factor. So either you had a situation. And of course, at the same time, you know, we're, you know, we're, you know, we're, you know we're, the space programs ended. We're cutting back on research. Um but even at the time, you had people who thought like, and I write a lot in the book, and it's become a little bit of a thing looking at environmental regulation, the national the, the National Environmental Protection Act. That some people that when that passed in 1970, people Congress at the time thought it was just kind of a kind of like a statement, like you know we we like a clean environment, so mm-hmm. let's pass this act. Certainly, there are environmental groups who thought very differently, who realized this could be something that would have actual teeth and really affect the economy. And there's a famous court case back then, which really helped implement NEPA, where the judge said, finally, we have a tool to slow down material progress. And guess what? They absolutely did. So mission accomplished there. Yeah, and I think in in the case of some of these regulatory burdens that have been placed on the economy for for any number of you know ostensibly good reasons when uh, they first came into existence, you have an increasing burden over time in ways that weren't you know just like you suggested weren't predicted when they were first passed. Uh, I've you know we've had a lot of people, um, some people on this on the show who have talked about who were experts on the the National Environmental Policy Act and the the kind of growth of uh, you know, federal kudzu when it comes to trying to get anything uh, big and important done in this country, you know, and, and they've told me, well, the, the first, you know, uh, you know, NEPA says, you know, if you, if you want the, the federal government's going to make any kind of, you know, uh, move of any importance, including letting other people do, uh, do something, they got to uh, review the environmental uh, impacts of it and uh, write up, write up a report, write up a statement. Uh, those original statements were like 10 pages long or 20 pages long or 50 pages long. Uh, they're now 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 pages long. They take years and millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars just to write the statement justifying what you want to do under this one federal environmental law. And, the, and so I think that's uh, a great example of whenever we might be considering passing a new law or implementing new regulations going forward, we need to have some sort of guardrails to make sure the next version of NEPA doesn't become a hundred times worse and more burdensome than the people who wrote it planned it on it becoming. I, I, you know, for sure. Listen, um, this, you know, I know I've been asked, well, you know, this is a, uh, you know, that environmental policy act that, that was something 50 years ago. I mean, what, you know, can we, maybe you need to move, uh, move on. But like this is actually still happening now. I mean, where you you know people who are trying to build you know high speed rail or trying to build a factory, trying to not forget about building the wind turbines, the factory to build you know uh, the wind turbines, you know they have to they have to fill out the you know these NEPA forms and it takes multiple years and it slows down the process. Uh, anybody who thinks we're going to have this massive clean energy transition where we're going to not just build you know, huge solar farms and wind turbine farms, but all the factories needed to construct it, like, well, you know, the energy transition will be a very long one if what, if, 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 unless we have that kind of environmental permitting reform. And I think there's a growing realization that, you know, there needs to be reform. But I find interesting, what I find super interesting is that, um, and I mentioned them in the book, sort of these, um, what they, they call themselves, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, progressive abundance people, supply side progressives, folks on the left, uh, like Ezra Klein and Derek Thompson. I'm not sure it goes much beyond them, but 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 uh, you know, they write about that, you know, and from the Atlantic and New York Times, they, you know, they'll think, oh, we need this kind of reform, this regulatory reform. Though there's, to me, there is zero recognition that this was a problem until the day before yesterday. And it's been a, it's been a multi-decade problem. So I think when you look at something as big 
as this downshift in, in, in productivity and progress, which to me is right up there with the Great Depression, um, considering the world we could have. Uh, it has been a multi-decade problem. And now I'm not expecting a great moment of uh, uh, a, a, a truth in you know, a, a, a truth commission. Uh, I think we should regulate that. It's been a long-term problem. If we don't do something, it'll be a, it'll continue to be a long-term problem. Yeah, and I think you know the point you make there about what what is getting slowed down by by some of these burdens and regulations is is important. I think a lot of people, if you ask them, uh, you know, if you put that situation in front of them, they'd say, "Well, I don't, you know, it's it's fine if some uh, big greedy corporation that wants to make industrial widgets has to like fill out a lot of environmental paperwork. So we want to make sure, you know, they don't they don't pollute from the widget factory. But this is stopping uh, also stopping." Uh, you know, windmills and solar farms, and it's in, in, and it's not even a, a for-profit thing. It's it's slowing down uh, cities from building uh, clean transit infrastructure, right? It's making it more expensive and and costing you you money in uh, taxpayer dollars. So, you know, we have this old kind of like Rachel Carson uh, environmentalist view of things, where there's like big dirty industry on one side, and then there's clean happy nature on the other. Uh, but that's not the situation we're in now. Uh, even if you are someone who is very, if you, is precisely if you are someone who is very worried about the future, worried about the environment, worried about the future of climate change, and you want things like uh, clean energy infrastructure, uh, you want clean transit, uh, and you want uh, government providing a lot of those things, uh, the problem with environmental review is making even that impossible to achieve. You know, it, it, again, you know, this is not... Well, I do talk about nuclear energy and, you know, uh, if, if this was a 100% clean edge energy economy, we'd probably be talking about climate change very differently. But the inability uh, that we have right now to efficiently, quickly, you know, create lots and lots of abundant, cheap power. Listen, I'm, I'm very excited by, you know, what's happening in AI. I know some of these sort of uh, real stagnationists, degrowthers, downwingers, whatever you want to call them, very worried about the job loss and the killer robots. But, I, but I'm extremely excited about the ability, I hope, of AI to really supercharge this economy, growth, scientific discovery. But what are we already being told? You know what? Even if you think that AI might do that, we can't do it. It requires too much energy. Do you know how much power all those GPUs suck up? We we can't do it. So sorry. Now that was what I heard the same argument about cryptocurrency, mm -hmm. and maybe I didn't care as much about <laughs> cryptocurrency, but I really really care uh, that we that they're saying we can't have data centers for this AI revolution because we just don't generate enough clean energy. You know how much you know how, how much it's gonna we're gonna have to use in ten years at the kind of these pay, pace of increase. I mean, give me a break. Let's go. Let, you, know, you know what? If there's a, there's an obstacle and there is an obstacle to having, and it's our choice. It is, these are absolute, it's not like we don't have the technology, even now, and that technology is getting better. This is purely a decision to have a less abundant present and a less abundant future. So I think let's, let's make a different decision as a society. Well, yeah, I mean, we have uh, nuclear technology that's uh, advanced in lots of ways, but the the basic understanding of how we make uh, of how we make uh, clean energy from fission has been around for seventy plus years. Uh, it's really not a uh, new technology, uh, which uh, brings me to I think one of uh, I think one of the most interesting points here. So you uh, mentioned uh, you know Derek Thompson, and as I saw you recently at the uh, the Breakthrough Institute's Eco Modernism Conference, and so the previous year, your same pretty much your same speaking slot, I think. Uh, Derek Thompson was there and he was talking about how he had set off to write this book about inventions and uh, he was very excited and about like the, the process of how how new technology gets invented and the creative spark and all of that. And uh, he had a great uh, anyone who's worked on a long research project can identify with this. He said he had a point where he realized like maybe he was actually researching the wrong thing because he came to think that well, obviously new inventions are important. It's almost more important for a society how they treat existing inventions and getting them from the idea spark point to actually implementing them and doing useful things with them. And, and that, uh, that lag between something being theoretically possible and something being implemented and actually uh, making life better for people is, uh, is maybe the bigger, bigger problem, certainly from a sort of like public policy and pol you know, politics standpoint, how we, how we encourage that or, or let that move forward. And 
uh, I think that connects really well to uh, part of uh, the book. And you point out that, you know, the prosperity of the post-World War II era was built, at least in part, on science and technology that was discovered and developed even maybe a generation earlier. And it sort of took time to get past, like, the worst part of the Great Depression and World War II before they could, like, roll it out and make it into practical applications that could, uh, you know, benefit people. Um, but I think it raises the question when we are looking back and saying, you know, we'll look at the 20th century and, you know, where was the good stuff that we like and where was the bad stuff that we don't like and how do we get more of the good stuff and less of the bad stuff? The, the question is, how did this timeline work? So if the, some of the post-World -War, War II prosperity was based on, you know, theoretical ideas that someone at, you know, Princeton came up with in 1931, uh, do we actually have to be worrying, of, are, are we connecting uh, 1950s America was just things that happened in the 1950s, or do we always need to be thinking about, well, what's the time lag between the theoretical physics and the, the microwave in your kitchen? Yeah, I, I think about that in two ways. One, it's now, I think, an accepted sort of economic principle and bit of economic history that oftentimes it does take a long time to move from, you know, breakthrough to invention to the sort of innovation that will be widely uh, diffused throughout uh, an economy. Um, and that that may take many years. And I think government policy has a role in oftentimes, unfortunately, creating a barrier to that in modern times. I mean, the classic example, I'm sure, you know, is electrification. It took a long time um, for factories to become electrified and not use, you know, steam powered turbines and things like that. It's just there's a lot of there's all there's a lot of already you know, sunk capital in there. And, you know, it's going to take time for the train people for it to change. It could take decades, which is super annoying. <laughs> and by the way, a similar example of me is uh, the Internet, where people are like, ah, you know, what, what are we going to do on the Internet other than maybe uh, check football scores or something? Uh, it, they have zero, pa some people have zero patience with sort of the time it takes for technology to diffuse throughout the economy or the people doing the diffusion, which are entrepreneurs. Uh, a lot of the focus of the, you know, the Biden administration has talked a lot about, we need a more productive economy, which is great, but like, it's not going to be just done by DOE grants, right? It's going to be done by entrepreneurs thinking up ways to use this technology. I mean, what are all the use cases for generative AI? I don't know, right? <laughs> what will be the new jobs created? I don't know. The entrepreneur's got to create them. And it's a, uh, that is that sort of lack of faith sort of in, in, in how an economy actually works. And if it isn't directed with a, a five or 10 year plan from the Department of Future uh, in Washington, then you know we shouldn't have any faith that's actually going to happen. So I think we do need to look at sort of these long timelines. And I hope as we think about AI, that where there's sort of this rush to regulate and people are like, well, what are we really regulating here? The ability to make some cool images? I don't know. I, I tell you, I don't know what, what you're regulating and I don't fully understand the risk of bad regulation. But if history is any guide, the risk of screwing it up and depriving us of lots of cool stuff is high. And, you know, another key element here, which again, like you as you sort of alluded to, the book gets into a lot, um, is the the sort of cultural receptivity to new ideas. So not just the the laws and taxes and regulations that are on the book, but uh, this sort of maybe a little bit harder to measure willingness to to take risks and accept risks. So you know you can look at this like uh, you know through the lens of pop culture. You can look at the books, the movie, the TV shows, um, and those. You know it seems to me those both influence our attitudes towards risk and are influenced by yes. cultural attitudes. Um, and But that can be sort of frustrating, I think, for, for a student of public policy, if my idea is to like, well, I want to, to recommend the best possible you know, new law or regulation that's going to help things move forward. But what if the biggest influence is this sort of squishy, hard to influence uh, you know, delta factor, uh, which, is, which is culture? And so what are we, you know, how do how, how do we change that? Um, you know, do we, can we pass the everyone be optimistic about the future act of 2023? 
<laughs> and if and if so, how would we, you know, how would we enforce it? Oh, um, one with significant penalties, <laughs> Richard. There will be significant penalties. stockades, uh, yeah. throwing tomatoes at people who are uh, who are too glum. Yeah, I think that is difficult. I think I think there's like a chicken and the egg issue here to some degree. Uh, I think the result is really this kind of down, you know, where everything came first. Uh, you know, bad policy, uh, you know, bad growth, bad stories. It all at this point is sort of working in nefarious uh, collaboration with each other. Um, and, and again, we're seeing with AI where, you know, we again, we spent we had about 15 minutes to think about what AI, how AI might help us with these chat GPT uh, innovations, generative AI and large language models before we start talking about the job loss and the, and, and the, and the killer robot. So, like, what do you do about that? Um Listen, I think, I think if we can get better policy, that will accelerate growth and progress in a way that's obvious to people, as it was in the late nineties. I think that I think if you can do that, that's that's a biggie. Because listen, we had very rapid growth in the nineties, and you know what? It was a period where people thought tomorrow, you know, you know, great satisfaction with the direction of the country. It was a time of rising inequality, but people kind of didn't care, other than the usual suspects who always care. Uh, because all boats really were rising. It wasn't some sort of weird conservative cliche. It was like actually happening. All boats were rising and people were optimistic and they weren't worried about like, you know, robots taking all the jobs. So if you're able to do that, that's great. But like, again, sort of what comes first. So what do you do about, what do you do about the culture? Um, I, I, I think there are some things we can do. I think we, I think, uh, you know, and I, I've had disagreements about this. I think bringing back world fairs, I think that would be great. Uh, I think people actually seeing this technology, seeing new technologies and what it can do uh, uh, would be would be super helpful. Uh, I would like to see more of more billionaires who are benefiting from our system, a system which rewards uh, entrepreneurship, finance more kinds of you know upwing culture and movie to me one of the greatest bits and we talk about all the downwing pessimistic you know movies well, to me one of the greatest bits of upwing culture uh came from spacex of like about a five or ten minute video they made about mars colonization i mean i mean i i, I am i was ready to go run through a wall uh after watching that it was absolutely it's absolutely a beautiful piece of animation uh and and actually it's my hope that with some of these AI tools that we don't have to rely on Hollywood figuring it out or billionaires cutting checks, uh, that we all can create images and and movies that are upwing and pro-progress. Uh, I'm already beginning to see it, some very exciting stuff. And and one of my favorite ideas, and not to, not to ramble on, is, you know, we're all aware of the doomsday clock, you know, the, from the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, how many minutes are we to midnight? When it started out, it was about nuclear war. Now it's about everything else. It's about nuclear war, pandemics, inequality, AI, of course. I would like to see, a, I would like to see the opposite. It's, I would like to see a Genesis clock. I would like to see a clock that shows not how many minutes to midnight, but how many minutes to a dawn of new prosperity. And it would be based on solving problems. Do we, you know, what is the percentage of people in deep poverty? Is that going down? How, you know, what percentage of our power comes from nuclear, uh, nuclear energy? All the, have all these different factors. So I would like to see that, my Genesis clock idea, <laughs> as, 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 which I think would have more actual substance to it than this sort of, you know, loosey goosey. Uh, today it's thirty seconds to midnight. Uh, it's five. It's five minutes. Uh, I so I am uh, I am I am pro Genesis clock. Uh, I'm very bearish on doomsday clocks. Excellent. So we are we are looking forward to uh, brighter tomorrow. And uh, and I can tell you, I have already been using uh, uh, Mid Journey, the uh, generative AI uh, image producing tool, to make some images of uh, new new life on Mars. So uh, just follow follow. And me you and I probably have very little. <laughs> maybe I'm speaking for myself, Richard. But if you're like most people, you and I do not have tremendous artistic abilities and this is enabling us to do it i mean it's, it's a beautiful thing yeah i would uh if you were if you were waiting me to uh to to do these illustrations with uh ink and pencils uh you would be waiting into in, into the next century but uh now we can we you can do it in 60 seconds um so one other really kind of like big picture concept i think that uh is is important to to your your book and your arguments is about uh, 
how do we in general confront risk and, and uncertainty? So like you said, there's optimism about things like uh, AI, but there's also people who are worried that there are gonna be these novel risks and there are gonna be potential dangers. Uh, and the question is how do we as a society and then also how as a government um, figure out how do we, what's, what's the way that makes most sense to, to respond to that while taking, taking potential risks seriously. So you mentioned work of some people like Aaron Waldowski and Mary Douglas who writ, wrote a lot about risk and, uh, and the societal response to it, um, both from sort of cultural anthropology, how do we think about risk in general, as well as applications to, to government policy. So uh, we've got uh, uh, what people call the precautionary principle uh, which you mentioned, and then uh, one analogy which I thought was very interesting, which is the the tree approach versus the grass approach <laughs> to to confronting potential peril uh, and dealing with adversity. Um, how does what what can the what can the tree and the grass teach us? If you would ask, like, which is the better sort of metaphor or model for a strong? resilient society to the to the uh to the to the, to whatever winds may blow against us um people would think like the mighty oak that is a, that is a strong that is a i mean just, it is the model of strength you know your your my my bond, my word is as strong as oak but in a hurricane if there's a crack in that tree uh, that very stiff tree, which isn't going to move with the wind, but will stand against these forces, and it cracks, it's done. That tree is done. A blade of grass, which may seem uh, not nearly as strong, it has a certain flexibility. It will move, and then it will bounce back. I think a society that can change, that can adapt, that is truly the resilient society. And what helps us? change, adapt, bounce back. Well, it's being a rich society and a technologically advanced society. And boy, oh boy, if we ever had a great example, it was really the pandemic where we had, I mean, numerous, many, many white papers about the risk of a pandemic. And we had a society that for you know the last, I don't know, 15, 20 years has been soaking in imageries of pandemics. Now, maybe those pandemics would lead to a zombie outbreak, but we all were sort of been, you know, aware and we had, you know, bird flu outbreak. Yet when this pandemic hit, we're like, where are all the masks? Where are all the ventilators? Where's all the preparation? As a, as a species, we're not very good at preparing for rare, severe, um, you know, catastrophes. So what, what does help? You're a rich country and you're a technologically advanced country and you're a well-governed country and you can try to solve problems on the fly. And that's what we did uh, during the pandemic with the vaccines. I think that is a powerful, it doesn't mean you can't plan for the future, but I would never, I would never want it all riding on my ability to perfectly plan for every single outbreak, every single problem. And that is the kind of resiliency that I think uh, progress and growth creates, and it's it's and it's wildly underrated. Uh, you know, the precautionary principle is better safe than sorry. Uh, you know, a more the more the more actionary principle is the greatest risk you can take is no risk at all. We don't know what the future holds, so we better have the tools to deal with whatever it is and be able to roll with the punches, come what may. Yeah, and I I think the vaccine development in in response to COVID-19 is a, maybe a, an underappreciated uh, dramatic example uh, of, of how resilient technology has made, wealth and technology has made us. Uh, you know, you point out, which, you know, which a lot of people were worried about before we actually got into the vaccine development, uh, how long developing such a vaccine would take. And so if you look back on the history of vaccines, uh, sometimes they take literal decades to develop, even for um, not for you know novel new uh, infections like COVID nineteen, but for things that we've been living with for for centuries, and you know we've, we've had uh, scientists working uh, you know for decades to try and say, well, we people you know thousands of people die every year from this disease, and we're really working on this vaccine, we're making making a little progress, but it's taken us a really long time. And that's just the way it's been for most of the vaccines that have been developed for major infectious diseases up until recently, uh, and from. And there were stories in the New York Times, for example, at the beginning of the, the pandemic saying, don't get too excited about vaccines. It could take us 10 <laughs> years, right? Um, which was you know, a little alarming to a lot of us sitting in, in our apartments, not going outside. Uh, and so it took you know, maybe about a year right, to get from the, be 
uh, the, the the conceptual uh, breakthrough to uh, deployable uh, vaccine that we knew was safe and effective and had been manufactured. But uh, the vast majority of that was testing for for safety and efficacy. The the vaccine itself was developed in less than a week, which I think was was so startling to me. I, I almost couldn't believe it, and I still think it hasn't kind of sunk sunk in with the rest of <laughs> the rest of my fellow Americans that uh, the vaccine itself with new M RNA technology um, was sort of designed in a you know CAD sort of computer assisted design uh, way um, by some very smart scientists at a few of our leading biotechnology companies. Uh, but imagine a scenario where we had AI tools that could simulate safety and efficacy research in human beings well enough that we would develop the vaccine in one week and then would be able to deploy it at scale in the second week, right? You, I mean, a glimpse. I mean, it's sort of a glimpse in what sort of is possible. It's sort of a glimpse in what we've been missing. Um, you know, like how many other examples? You know, you know, over the summer there's this, um, you know, uh, you know, paper that said we had created that these Korean researchers had created this room temperature superconductor so electricity can move without resistance. And if we, and if that was possible, like. Like everything's possible. You begin to you begin to look at Star Trek and figure out like, hey, we could actually do a lot of these things. Maybe not transporters, but maybe a lot of the other stuff. And people start, you know, we start talking about like what we could have. And then the paper didn't pan out. I'm like, well, maybe we should be working harder on this, on this kind of technology. If that's to me, it was a maddening glimpse of the possible. And to, and and that is such a good example you raised. Imagine if we already if we already had these AI tools, if we already had uh, small modular nuke reactors or nuclear fusion reactors. This is not this is not the best of all possible worlds. And you, and you don't need sci-fi to create the kind of world that seems sci-fi. You, what you need is a little better economic growth, removing some barriers doing things we know how to do, which is fun scientists. Uh, and we can create that world. And again, it's a choice not to. And I want us to make a different choice. That's a great example with the AI and the vaccines, Richard. Yeah, and I think uh, in just a very practical sense, you know, when when are we going to, you know, in what society are we going to have more optimistic uh, uh, attitudes about the future? What society are we going to have more more money, more, uh, quote, quote, surplus value to invest in perspective, maybe they'll pan out, maybe they won't right away, uh, research, uh, it's going to be a society that is, that is wealthier and where there's more growth. Um, what, if we have a degrowth society where we're, we're you know, intentionally putting uh, uh, human civilization on a glide path towards, towards smaller and lesser, uh, there's, going to be, there's going to be less for everyone. There's going to be more intense competition for what's left over. And, and people are not going to be excited about spending what little they have left on some research initiative that may take years to deliver uh, to deliver back results. The, z- so, the zero sum mindset, the degrowth mindset, the mindset of that that there's nothing you can do about the constraints of society. You can't push those constraints. You can't push for the, the technological frontier. Um, that. That is a, I believe that is a civilization killer. And we got a big stomach full of that during the pandemic where we saw what it was like. Well, how well do we deal with shortages? And, you know, I mean, for, I mean, fairly minor shortages overall. How do we deal with going to a supermarket and not, and there are not, and there are not enough Doritos. And that is a very minor thing. It is an absolute loser to me. That is that is a that is fantasy thinking that people who already live in rich societies are going to accept a worse way of life. And it is beyond it is nightmarish thinking to try to sell that to people who don't have very much and to tell them, you know what, you'll 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 never be you'll never live like the folks in the West do today. That is, I'm so, I'm sorry. You're going to have to ex- accept something different. I mean, to me, it's it borders on the monstrous. Yeah, this is not a future where uh, you'll you'll own nothing and you'll be happy. This is this is a future where uh, uh, people with bad ideas will, will will threaten you with owning nothing, and people will be furious. <laughs> <laughs> right, this is right. That, 
It's a great, it's, once again, as we saw, as we saw uh, during communism in the 20th century, it is a great miscalculation about human nature. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, Jim, thank you for being with us. This has been a fantastic conversation. And you know what? I predicted it would be great. And I was right. And uh, so call you. <laughs> You're the futurist. You're the <laughs> you so, predicted the future. So possibly in the future, uh, we can uh, have another conversation. Yes. Uh, I will be on the space elevator. You will be in Musk City on Mars <laughs> yes. um, next to the uh, you know solar array. Uh, and uh, we can talk about all the great stuff that has happened since your, your, your book was uh, released. Um, so uh, before we go, uh, tell people where to find you online, encourage people to buy the book. Oh, uh, please buy the book, The Conservative Futures, How to Create the Sci-Fi World We Are Promised, available everywhere, online, in person, anywhere one might think to buy a book from Amazon. Uh, bar it's, it's, it's everywhere. I also have a newsletter. Uh, it comes out a few times a week called Faster Please about acceleration. Uh, and I, my work also pops up on AI, on the AI website. I have a couple of podcasts, the Faster, the Faster Please podcast, the Political Economy podcast. If you want a, just a, a belly full of this kind of pro-progress, but realistic optimism, uh, those are some of the places you can find it. Please buy the book. All right. You're an absolute one-man content machine. Um, so uh, people will be, will be seeking that out. And uh, until next time, thanks for being with us, Jim. Richard, it's been awesome. Thank you.